Tonight, seven members of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra killed in the raid on their hideout in Imo State as gunmen killed three security personnel in an attack on Governor Uzo Dima's country home. As attacks by bandits continue in Zamfara State despite the government's dialogue option, Governor Bilo Matawale says a new strategy to tackle the menace is in the works. Parents of the Greenfield University students still in captivity demand rescue of their children. President Buhari describes killing of the abductees as barbaric terror attacks. And Indian hospitals send SOS as patients die because of oxygen shortage as new record COVID case numbers and deaths are set for a third consecutive day. On business news tonight, Central Bank disperses 35 billion naira to fertilizer blending plants in its effort to boost local food production. And on sports news, Watford seal promotion to the English Premier League after a 1 0 win over Millwall. In a seeming endless cycle of attacks, gunmen yet again struck again in Emo State today, killing three security operatives. This time the attackers dared the state governor and descended on his country home, burning down some parts of the building and cars in the compound. And in the process of repelling the attack, an NSCDC official on duty in the premises was killed. And while escaping from the scene, the gunmen killed a police sergeant and another NSCDC official at another part of the town. Meanwhile, seven members of the proscribed IPOP have also been killed by security operatives. One of them is said to be the leader of the group in the southeast. Our correspondent, Itok Bekute, reports. This is the Omuma Market Square, a few kilometers from Governor Opus Odima's house in Omuma community. It used to be a busy market, but due to the ugly incident that happened Saturday morning, it's been deserted. So, who could not get access into the compound as security operatives barricade the house. According to the residents of the area who witnessed the arson, the gunmen came heavily armed. People are scared. Our people are, we are running away. Mm. So all of a sudden we saw so many people that they, are, they, are, they, were, they, they were vehicles and uh, tipper. Mm. You know, so people are running away. So the next thing, they drove in in hopes and they used uh, those tipper to hit the gate and to come in there. So that is what really happened. They want a quick intervention by the government. Many governors has come. Why must our own be different? So I am appealing to the federal government to put more tight in security to make sure that all these hoodlums are tracked down. For the State Commissioner for Information, the government is wasting no time in getting to the root of the matter. They attempted to attack it and probably with the aim of raising it down. But uh, fortunately, uh, very gallant uh, uh, security operatives attached to, to, to the governor's house were able to repel the, the attempt and so they did not succeed. But what has happened today in Omuma shows that... Uh, this government is equal to the tax, and we are alive, we are not sleeping, and any such uh, attacks will also be equally repelled. Police authorities say they have killed the overall commander of the Eastern Security Network of IPOP, popularly known as Ikonso Commander, and six other armed fighters said to have been responsible for the attack on the Imo State Police headquarters and the headquarters of the Nigeria Correctional Service. IPOP has reacted to this development, threatening more attacks. Recently, the five governors of the South East States agreed to set up a Bubago security outfit to complement the efforts of security agencies in the South East to bring crime to its barest. Many hope that the result of this decision will be seen in the reduction of attacks to the barest minimum as soon as possible. Ejito Pakute, Channels Television News. Over in Nasarawa State, gunmen have killed at least nine farmers in Ajimaka village. That's a thief settlement of AK Development Era in Doma, local government era of Nasarawa State. The president of Thief Development Association, Peter Ahemba, told Channels Television that the gunmen invaded the community at 2 a.m., killing the nine persons, including women and children, with many others injured. 
A joint team of police and military personnel have been deployed to the area, while the Deputy Commissioner of Police in charge of State Criminal Investigation Department is leading an investigation into the incident. Governor Abdullahi Suley, who has condemned the attack, said efforts are on to prevent an escalation of the situation. Every day I, I wake up, I go through these kinds of challenges in the state, actually. This morning, I woke up with what happened in a place called Akimade, very close to Rukubi, where Afulani is killed, nine thief people. As I'm talking to you now, we are working on a, the process of burying the people. So the, the discussion I was having two minutes before I even came out here was concerning the burial of it. So we could manage the situation without now escalating into something else. Meanwhile, Calm has returned to Gaydam, that's a community in Yobe State, after suspected Boko Haram insurgents attacked the town last night. A locals told Channel's television that the insurgents stayed in the community through the night, engaged in a gun battle with military personnel, which continued up until this morning. A heavy-duty machines for road construction, a firefighting vehicle and some telecoms facilities were also burned by the insurgents before they left. In a statement, the Nigerian army said 21 of the insurgents were killed in the encounter. A gun truck with an anti-aircraft gun mounted on it, as well as eight AK-47 rifles, were among the weapons recovered from the insurgents. Three soldiers were also said to have sustained injuries, but are in stable condition. The president has condemned the killing of three of the students kidnapped from the Greenfield University, Kaduna State. President Muhammadu Buhari, in a statement, described the victims as bright youngsters who were cut down in their prime by evil people. According to him, the recurring incidents of kidnappings and killings in the country and Kaduna State, in particular, are barbaric terror attacks, describing as unfortunate statements by political and religious leaders that seem to further incite and stoke the pain and anguish of mourning families. President Buhari said addressing this scourge requires a great empathy and coming together as a society to squarely confront the evil elements. Meanwhile, aggrieved parents of kidnapped students of Greenfield University in Kaduna State have appealed to the federal and the Kaduna State governments to assist them in rescuing their children who are still in the custody of their abductors days after they were kidnapped. Their appeal is coming after bodies of three of the abducted students were recovered by security agencies at a village near the institution on Friday. The parents who converged on the school say they are worried that their children might be killed if they don't meet up with the demand of 800 million naira ransom by the kidnappers. These are aggrieved parents of the kidnapped students of Greenfield University in Kaduna State. The expressions on their faces is an indication that all isn't well. They are here to discuss ways of ensuring the rescue of their wards from captivity following Tuesday's abduction of 20 of them from the institution. In addition to the 20 students, three members of staff were also kidnapped while another staff member was shot dead during the operation. However, there is a twist in the tale when the bodies of these three students were found on Friday, April the 23rd at a village near the school. Mrs. Loretta Tahiru is a mother to one of the abducted students of the university, unable to keep her emotion in check. She describes her condition as devastating, especially as she was with him just hours before the incident. He returned to the school on Tuesday. Only for me to hear on Wednesday that my son has been kidnapped. It is a nightmare. I have not slept. I have not slept. I have not eaten. I'm appealing to the public to assist us. The demand is unbearable. The amount is unthinkable. Another parent, Marcus Zamai, condemns the kidnap of the innocent students just as he describes the ransom placed on them as unrealistic. Look at the type of parents. 800 million is not a joke. If public will not come to our aid, I don't know how we can come out of this. It's not only the parents of the students that are worried about their present status. 
The Catholic Archbishop of Kaduna Diocese, Most Reverend Matthew Ndagusu, is also lending his voice to the call for their release. We can never give up. We must always, uh, we are people of hope. So as we continue to encourage the people never to give up, we also continue to tell the government to do the needful. The focus on schools as subjects of attacks by bandits is gradually becoming the norm. What these parents and other stakeholders in Kaduna State are saying is that the time has now come for action to ensure that all schools, whether private or public, are adequately secured for the safety of the students and staff. Staying with security, the Zamfara State Governor Bill Matawale is considering a new tactic in addressing the insecurity in that state as more attacks continue despite the olive branch extended to the bandits. He is now warning the bandits to either repent or change base as he draws a new roadmap in his approach to handling the issue of security. The governor issued the warning today when the chairman of the APC Governors Forum paid him a condolence visit. While the chairman of the Progressive Governors Forum and Kebi State Governor Ababakar Atiku Bagudu said they were in the state to extend their heartfelt condolence to the government and people of Zamfara State over the recent attacks that resulted in the loss of innocent lives. From North Kigawa State and myself, I visiting here today to extend our condolence to His Excellency the Governor and the people of Zamfara State for this tragic loss of life, which is regrettable and shameful because I remember being a member part of the Senate, the Senate delegation in 2014 when over 90 people were killed in Pansar. And we thought that was the worst. But uh, still we have this tragic and unfortunate universal of fortune. We pray that this will be the last. And we pray that the peace, commendable effort that are being pursued by His Excellency and the good people of the state. We are going to have more meeting with security by tomorrow. At least we will take three to four days to strategize more in the best option that the state government feel comfortable to take and uh, to tackle this issue of this insecurity. It's more support from Mr. President and the security agencies to support the government and any way we found necessary that uh, will tackle the issue that we have at hand. In part two after the break, about two months after the release of students abducted from the Government Science Secondary School in Kagara, Niger State, we will revisit the school and then we'll bring you an update on the latest situation happening there. Do stay with us. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Seven members of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra killed in a raid on their hideout in Imo State as gunmen killed three security personnel in an attack on Governor Uzodema's country home. As attacks by bandits continue in Zamfara State, despite the government's dialogue option, Governor Matawali says a new strategy to tackle the menace is in the works. Parents of the Greenfield University students still in captivity demand rescue of their children. President Mohamed Buhari describes killing of the abductees as barbaric terror attacks. And Indian hospitals send SOS as patients die because of oxygen shortage. And as new record COVID case numbers and deaths are set for a consecutive third day. About two months after their release, some of the students abducted from the Government Science Secondary School, Kagara, in Niger State, say they are still haunted by the torture they went through in the hands of their abductors for 10 days. But the state government says it is providing psychosocial counseling to them. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, has been following up on the Kagara abduction and filed this report.
empty, deserted, lonely. This is what is left of Government Science Secondary School, Kagara. Two months after 27 students were abducted in the school, we're back to see what the school has become. Mobile policemen are mounting watch in the school. We learned they were deployed just after the attack. These two security men who saw what happened the night the bandits struck and abducted the students tell me what transpired. They lead me to the scene where one of the victims was shot dead. February 17, 2021 was the day the bandits who attacked government science secondary school, Kagara, stormed the school at night and there they picked 27 students. Now this is the spot where a student named Benjamin was said to have been shot and killed. The blood stain is still there and the key belonging to him, according to what we've heard, is still lying on the ground. The memory of the attack is still very fresh on the minds of the people in Kagara. The classrooms have been under lock and key since the attack. And while all that remains in the hostels are remnants of the students' belongings. Away from the school, we travel to Kavankaro Town, the Paikuru local government area of the state, to see two victims of the abduction, Abakuk and Paulinas. They say we should run. If not, they will kill us here. Then they started pushing us like cow. They will say, ar, 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 like the way Flanagan usually do in the bush. Mm. That's where they are pushing us. They share their experience, especially after they regain their freedom. When I usually dream, sometimes I will find myself in that forest. I, was, I, was, I usually see the way they treat us. They will ask us to do this thing, to do this, to do this. Sometimes if I see people with guns like this, I feel scared for my life because for that place, they always, I always see guns always. So if I see guns like this, I, I feel scared in my life. Back in Mina, the state capital, the Commissioner for Education tells us about the state government's efforts to help the recovery process of the victims and the measures taken to secure school children in the state. We saw that um, there was that fear there was that um, anxiety in them and uh, we felt that the psychosocial support was going to at least give them some hope, some reassurance to know that um, at least there is more to eat. And we have 11 schools which um, we, we term as schools in high risk and um, what we're trying to do now is that uh, we have tried to work out a template where um, some of the students would actually go to school in their communities and we're going to cluster some to uh, actually be able to absorb them to some of our boarding schools that have extra facilities. Niger State currently has 496 secondary schools and 3,000 primary schools spread across its 25 local government areas, most of which have suffered years of neglect by successive governments. Although the current administration of Governor Abubakar Bello says it has expended billions of naira in the last six years to rehabilitate some of the schools, Government Science Secondary School Kagara is still in a dilapidated condition, waiting for the government to fulfill its promise of a facelift. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. It appears the damage from the rainstorm in Calabar, the Cross River State capital, is more extensive than previously thought, as the University of Calabar suffered major damage to its facilities. The Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Florence Obi, is calling for urgent intervention to restore properties worth millions of naira. She made the appeal in Calabar, the Cross River State capital, shortly after inspecting some of the affected facilities in the institution. A five-hour rainfall with associated windstorm has left the Cross River State formal citadel of learning a site of literal chaos. From the falling telecommunication mast and trees, 
a damaged printing press to multiple blown out roofs. The vice chancellor of the University of Calabar looks on distraught. <laughs> It takes an effort to clear up the mess as the students appeal for help so that their studies will not be affected. We are pleading on the federal government and the school authorities to come to our aid because last night we were stranded. Most of us had to sleep on the floor because of that. And because of that, we don't have electricity supply because most of the electricity supply was destroyed by water. And if per eventual light should come now, Many of us will be electrocuted. It's a very sorry state altogether, so it's a very wrong one. We do hope and we are praying, we are calling on meaningful Nigerians, corporate bodies, uh, even them, uh, we are calling on NDDC, we are calling on all, all meaningful uh, student-friendly organizations to come around and help us. For the Vice-Chancellor of the institution, Professor Florence Obi, she describes as a calamity as properties worth millions of Naira were destroyed. She appeals for quick intervention from government and others who can help. I've just gone around our printing press. Oh, my God. It's so sad. We've just invested so much in the printing press. In fact, it's, it's, it's a calamity for the university today. We are just sad. We are confused. And um, you recall that we, we came into office with nothing. And we've just been struggling to, 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 to keep the university afloat. Even our well-wishers that came to do the initial jobs for us, we haven't paid them. And again, this has befallen us. So it's just a very sad day. I don't know what else to say than perhaps to call on um, uh, well-meaning Nigerians. Alumni, please come to our aid. NDDC, you are on, please come to our aid. It seems the aftermath of the devastation caused by the heavy downpour and windstorm that occurred this week in the Cross River State capital is yet to be fully evaluated as residents outside the university community continue to count their loss. Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS and Other Related Matters has summoned the DPO of Ilasson Police Station, Mrs. Onye Wamigu, to help it in its quest to deliver justice in the case of Mr. Paul Lucky. On October the 20th, 2020, at about 8 p.m., Paul Lucky, a driver and security officer at Jakande Estate in the Ilasson Aja era, reportedly had an altercation with a police officer, Sergeant John Dagbo of the Ilasson Police Station, who allegedly shot him and took his body away. A witness, Mr. Olariwaju Kazim, the Community Development Association Chairman of Jakonde Estate in Ilasson, who testified before the panel, says all efforts to retrieve the body from the police has failed. When I got to the police station to meet with the DPO, and I told her that the community youths were are very angry of the incident that occurred, but the only way we can make peace is for the police to release the cops to the family and the youth. She told me to give her some days because the cops has been taken to Ikeja mortuary and that she will try as much as possible to talk with our boss, Commissioner of Police, Lagos State, because the corps is referred to ends as corps. National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, that's the NDLEA, has intercepted drugs concealed in a statue of Mary and Otto's spare parts during a raid. Now, the stint operation, which had operatives embedded in two Korea companies in Lagos, seized 500 grams of heroin going to Canada, hidden inside an auto spare, and 140 grams of methamphetamine 
going to the Philippines concealed inside a statue of Mary. Now, a statement by the agency adds that 3.1 kilograms of cannabis going to the UAE concealed inside spices and another kilogram going to the United Arab Emirates were hidden inside local herbs and have also been intercepted. Nigeria will require 352 billion R to combat malaria this year alone. This is according to the Minister of Health, Dr. Sage Hanere, who is appealing for support from the organized private sector and government as the COVID-19 pandemic has seriously impacted government's revenues negatively. Now, the minister, who is speaking in Abuja ahead of the World Malaria Day on Sunday, said that the government is working to establish a malaria council to drive domestic funding for the elimination of the disease. So 25th day of April every year is set aside by the World Health Organization as World Malaria Day. This year, the theme is Zero Malaria, Draw the Line Against Malaria, a call to action to raise the bar for malaria diagnosis, treatment and control. Although some progress has been made in this area, malaria continues to remain a leading cause of death in Nigeria, even in the face of increased funding and interventions from government. What is even more worrisome is that despite funding from the government and partners, 44% of household out-of-pocket expenditure is on malaria. Nigeria continues to bear the disproportionate brand of the malaria, the malaria toll, accounting for 27% and 23% of global cases and deaths, respectively. The 2020 World Malaria Report from the World Health Organization reveals that Nigeria alone contributes 27% of global malaria cases and 23% of global malaria-related deaths. Government says it will need 352 billion naira to combat malaria in 2021. Malaria is a parasitic disease which spreads to people through the bites of infected female Anopheles mosquitoes. Experts say apart from scaling up testing and treatment for malaria, there is need to also attack the vector. The National Malaria Strategic Plan, the vision in that plan is for us to attain a less than 10 percent parasite prevalence today we are 23 percent and we want to at least take off not less than 13 percent out of that 23. according to the who malaria accounts for more than 60 percent of hospital visits in nigeria 20 percent of under five mortality and 11 percent of maternal mortality the Oxford University recently discovered a vaccine for malaria with over 70% efficacy. This discovery could just be the game changer if it is certified by the WHO. And when the news at 10 returns, we'll get more insight into the malaria scourge as the director, Center for Infectious Diseases Research at the Bayera University in Kano, Professor Issa Sadiq Abubakar joins us from our Kano studios. Plus, the Central Bank of Nigeria disburses 35 billion naira to fertilizer blending plants in its efforts to boost local food production. And that will be on Business News. Do join us again. Welcome back. Let's get more perspective on this important issue of the malaria scourge and the way forward. We're now being joined live from our Kano studio by the Director, Center for Infectious Diseases Research at the Bayero University, Kano, Professor Issa Sadiq Abubakar. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10, Professor. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, let's begin with the good news coming from the Oxford Institute on the development of a malaria vaccine set to be 77% effective. What's your reaction to this development? Well, um, this is a very important development in the effort aimed at eliminating the malaria scourge across the world. And oftentimes people have been saying that the story about COVID-19 is not all about bad news. 
uh, COVID-19 has stimulated a number of scientists across the world to not only make efforts aimed at discovering a cure as well as a protection against COVID-19, but for other important diseases. And of course, for us in Africa or in tropical regions generally in the world, malaria is one very, very important scourge that has been responsible for almost four times the deaths of uh, people in this continent than uh, COVID-19 itself. So it is an important step that we have come closer to discovering a vaccine that may solve the problem of malaria to a large extent in our continent. So as a scientist, I'm happy about this development and I hope that it will be taken further uh, until it becomes the final answer. Interesting development indeed. But why do you think this has taken uh, so long, or why has it taken this long, rather, uh, to achieve this breakthrough in the research concerning the malaria vaccine? Yeah, the effort aimed at discovering an effective, safe, and potent malaria vaccine has been there for more than a century. But the difficulty has to do with the, uh, pro the protozoan parasites that is responsible for causing malaria. It has over 5,400 genes which are responsible for the infection itself. And any discovery of antibodies that will fight against these genes has to look at as many as possible of these 5,400 genes. Just to give an example with COVID-19, for example, it has about only 12 genes. That is why it is much easier for scientists to discover antibodies that will uh, fight against uh, COVID-19 virus, that is the virus causing its SARS-CoV-2, compared to the protozoan parasite that is responsible for malaria. Uh, a lot of efforts have been made uh, trying to discover the protection, but it is taking so long because uh, it is a very difficult thing to do. But then uh, scientists across the different parts of the world have been making effort and they were clo making, uh, going closer and closer to discovering a potent vaccine. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I, I believe so. But, of course, you'll agree with me that Nigeria is still a leading country with very high malaria prevalence, as the WHO report says is responsible for over 60 percent of hospital, hospital visits in the country. Now, why have we not been able to eliminate the disease like some formerly endemic countries, like, say, Algeria, for instance? Okay, uh, eliminating malaria will require a lot of effort, not only vaccine development, for example, we need to have a strengthened health system. A lot of investments have to go in. Our governments and all our partners must invest heavily so as to strengthen our health system to make it resilient. We need to up, up our game with regards to prevention, with regards to diagnosis, and with regards to the treatment of malaria. We need, for example, to make sure that we attract the mosquitoes that are responsible for transmission and that will be done through indoor residual spraying as well as outdoor uh, spraying of the mosquito itself and by taking other measures like clearing bushes and stagnant waters around and apart from that we need to have a potent diagnostic technique and the rapid diagnostic technique which we are using is yielding fruits, but it is not yet solving all the problems because it is not picking all the cases uh, that we are dealing with. And then we need to ensure, apart from accurately diagnosing, we need to ensure prompt treatment. We are currently developing resistance against some of the anti-malarial drugs. And it is a continuous fight between us and the parasite for scientists to always discover newer ways to fight this disease at the level of prevention, at the level of diagnosis, as well as at the level of treatment. And to ensure that this is achieved, our governments 
need to invest heavily, much more than it is doing right now. All right, so Professor Issa Sadiq Abubakar, Director, Center for Infectious Diseases Research at the Bayero University, Ghana. We thank you so much for your thoughts on the news attack. Thank you very much. Moving on now, the remains of human rights activist and spokesperson of the pan yoruba social political group, Afeniferi Atiyinka Udumaki, have been laid to rest in his hometown in Oshun State. Present at the burial were his wife and other family members, some governors and other dignitaries. A leader of the Afeniferi group, Pa Ayo Adibanjo, says late Yinka Udumaki stood against all odds in his fight for a better Nigeria, stressing that the late comrade has a rare quality in his generation. A fighter, human rights activist, and public commentator who until his final days committed his all to the progress of Nigeria. Late comrade Yinka Odumaki submitted to the cold hands of death on April the 3rd, 2021. His remains arrive in his hometown in Moru, Ife North, in Oshun State, accompanied by an entourage of family, friends, associates, various government representatives, and other well wishers. The remains of late comrade Odumaki is committed to Mother Earth in a solemn way. Late Odumaki's commitment to emancipation of the oppressed is resilience for national development and the United Democratic Nigeria was re-echoed by his wife. Yinka, you are not dead because what you stood and died for we continue to re-echo, to re-vibrate forever and ever. Leader of Yoruba Social Cultural Group, Afeni Ferry, Pa Ayo Adebanjo, charges Nigerians to imbibe the spirit of service to the nation like late Odumaki. He has qualities as a politician, as a progressive. It's rare among the generations standing around here. Some governors in the Southwest present take turns to extol the beliefs and virtues of the comrade. He has left for us on this side of humanity a legacy of inspirational service, fierce loyalty to the Yoruba race, and relentless contributions to the quest for a greater nation. He did not live a Western life. He was never apologetic about the Yoruba agenda, but he was also not a secessionist. He was always clear about the path to progress. Late Odumaki's memories will remain dear to the history of the country. The development of any country lies with the creativity of the youth. This message has been re-echoed by Mrs. Folorosha Alakija, founder of Rose of Sharon Foundation and its youth empowerment program held in Lagos. Various speakers at the event highlighted the need for the Nigerian youth to find a place of relevance in the society. The event, which had both online and on-site participants, is the seventh in its series. It's the seventh edition of the Youth Empowerment Program of the Rose of Sharon Foundation. Though over 2,000 youth registered to be part of the program, only a few participants are physically present in consonance with the COVID-19 preventive measure. Others join virtually. You've got to be... The theme for this year's edition is Nigerian Youth as a Tool for National Development, which the host, Mrs. Falonjo Alakija, expatiates on in our opening However, remark. You and I know that resorting to criminal behaviors isn't the answer. Secondly, we all can't leave the country. But if we all work towards building the nation through positive creative and productive activities, we can make this country a better place to live in. While discussing various topics tied to the theme, including contribution of the Nigerian youth to national development, the role of education, 
as well as harnessing opportunities. The speakers highlighted the need for young people to acquire requisite skills, drive and knowledge. I normally would say that the future belongs to those who have the capacity to learn, the humility to unlearn, and the audacity to relearn. The abundance of the natural resources such as we have in Nigeria, oil and several minerals, and even talent, mean little or nothing unless we can creatively, and by using innovation and expanding value, hard to whatever it is that we have in terms of talent and resources. The more you continue to acquire skills and develop yourself, you will leave many behind. And just like the triangle is, you can see that it becomes narrower as you climb up. So, you have lesser people to compete with. According to the United Nations, about 62% of Nigeria's population are below 25 years of age, which makes the country a useful population. Making the most of these will require carefully orchestrated mentorship programs, such as what the Rose of Sharon Foundation Youth Empowerment Program stands for. Chris Elams, Channels Television News. Business News is up next. Tenyala Shabwale is standing by. Thanks a lot, Aya. Welcome to Business News. The central bank has been speaking of its intervention to ensure food security as well as reflate the economy following the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic across all sectors of the economy. According to the Director of Development Finance, Mr. Yusuf Yula, the latest of such intervention is the disbursement of 35 billion naira to fertilizer blending plants in the country to boost food production. This is a scheme to ensure that uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria provides working capital to support raw materials acquisition by blending plants to guarantee local supply of fertilizers. 35 billion naira has been disbursed to the various fertilizer blending plants in conjunction with the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority, NSIA. Agri Small and Medium Enterprise Investment Scheme, AXMES. This is a partnership with the Bankers Committee to support agribusiness and SMEs. Over 111 billion has been disbursed to 29,000 beneficiaries as at March 2021. Meanwhile, about 13 years since the adoption of the Nigeria Sugar Master Plan, less than 5% of sugar is produced locally uh, through the Backward Integration Program. In this report, we take a look at how much has been achieved through the public-private partnership in the nation's sugar industry. The quest to achieve 100% self-sufficiency in sugar production gave birth to the Nigerian Sugar Master Plan by the National Sugar Development Council. The master plan is to ensure that local production is raised as well as end the era of importing refined sugar for local consumption, which currently stands at over 1.8 million metric tons yearly. Clearly, not much has been achieved as Nigeria still ranks among the top 10 importers of sugar globally. However, around 30,000 metric tons of Nigeria's annual consumption is produced locally, a far cry from where we hope to be as a nation. Recently, allegations and counter allegations began to make the rounds of a monopoly, price fixing, and artificial scarcity among the industry players. Analysts believe this was a major distraction to the objectives of self-sufficiency. You guys are some of the biggest industrialists in the country. You know, bring your expertise, bring your know-how, bring your money into this sector. Let us see how we can conquer it. And the fact that we haven't done so is something that really uh, the Ministry of Trade and Investment needs to look into. The Ministry of Finance, the CBA, need to really come and sit down and find out why this hasn't happened yet because these are some of the biggest players in the game. According to reports by the government, the fiscal incentives are to allow private investors import raw sugar and refine for local consumption as well as other benefits. 
I start from the success story that we've had, which is refinery. And then I've gone around the three refinery. I'm impressed with what I've seen. And I'm very sure that the same commitment that we put in putting all this refinery in place, we will now transfer the same commitment to backward integration, which require a lot of capital and a lot of land and a lot of commitment. Some of the industrial giants give a hint on how much work has gone into achieving the targets in the master plan. We've developed um, a total of 3,000 hectares. We built a sugar mill. Um, we built a sugar estate and the infrastructure that comes with that land. Uh, we've invested over 65 billion in that, and we've invested another 200 million dollars in the mill, in the refinery here in Apapa. We have a refining capacity currently of 1.5 million metric tons. Um, with this, when completed, it will increase that to 1.7 million metric tons. The plan is to ensure that for as much as possible, we should be able to provide Nigerians with cheaper alternatives to imported sugar. With the level of engagement, many expect the momentum to be sustained in order to meet local demand as well as make the nation a net exporter of sugar in the future. The Department of Petroleum Resources and Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission are firming up fresh plans to address the perennial challenges facing gas-fired power plants in the country. Speaking during a meeting in Abuja, the director of DPR, Engineer Saki Owalu, says the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code, which was launched last year, is being tweaked to address inherent issues. Across the value chain, we have people that explode this gas. Should seismic explode the gas, drill, bring out the gas, process it, transmit it into customers like you. In the process, there are a lot of challenges. Challenges with respect to agreements on buyer and seller, of taker, shipper, agents. So this we identify as a big challenge in addition to other challenges. And that's business news tonight. I'm Tenyo Lashaboale. It's back to you, Ayo. Many thanks, Tenyola. Of course, in sports news, we'll be coming up in just a moment. Right about now, Kaido Kikulu is uh, going to tell us uh, what's the latest uh, as far as uh, Watford Football Club is concerned as they head back to the English Premier League. Kaido. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ayo. And you're right, it's good news for Watford, which bounced back to the Premier League at the first time of asking after a 1-0 win of a Millwall sealed promotion. Watford will join Norwich in a top flight next season. The Nigeria trio of William Trostekung, Isaac Success and Dele Bashiru will relish an opportunity to play in the English elite division with the Hornets. And in the English Premier League, Liverpool have suffered another setback in a week as Joe Willock's 94th minute equaliser earned Newcastle United a 1-1 draw at Anfield, which prevented the champions from moving into the top four. But Chelsea took a huge step towards securing a Champions League spot as Timo Werner's first goal since February helps the Blues defeat top four rivals West Ham United. Urbana's bearing slogans calling for the removal of Liverpool's American ownership have been displayed outside Anfield before the team's match against Newcastle as fans continued to show their dissatisfaction over the aborted European Super League project. The sentiments were similar, however, with club owners the targets of criticism. Enough is enough, FSG out, and our club, our game, were the words on some of the banners referencing Fenway Sports Group and principal owner John Henry. There were around 150 Liverpool fans outside the stadium. And in a related development, hundreds of Manchester United fans have gathered outside Old Trafford to protest against the Glazer family's ownership over the club's involvement in the European Super League. A large number assembled by the Trinity statue with supporters setting off flares, hanging banners and scarves outside Old Trafford, with many wearing the green and gold colours, synonymous with fan protests against the Glazers, which have occurred since the American family acquired the club back in 2005. It's
It is the second time Manchester United fans have publicly expressed displeasure with the Glazers this week. On Thursday, a small group of protesters broke into the club's quarantine training centre to voice their discontent with the club's owners after they decided to join the breakaway competition. And Schalke 04 have appealed for police protection at training next week after angry fans attacked the team bus following the club's relegation from the German Bundesliga. A few supporters hurled the team bus with eggs and confronted players on their return to the city. After defeat at Armenia, Belfit saw Schalke relegated for the first time in 30 years. Some players were reportedly followed to their homes and threatened in the wake of the loss, while one of them got his car damaged. Schalke 04 reiterated that they will not accept any instances where the health and safety of its employees are threatened or endangered. Well, that's Sports News for tonight. Thank you for watching. The News at 10 continues with Ayo. Many thanks, Kaide. The African Union has called for an end to military rule in Chad, whose president was killed by rebels. Following the death of President Idris Deby, the army immediately announced that his son, Mohammed, will head a military council for 18 months before elections are held. Opposition parties have condemned the move and have called for a civil disobedience. While rebel group Front for Change and Concord in Chad has rejected the new leader, saying Chad is not a monarchy. The AU's 15-member Peace and Security Council says power should be restored to civilian authorities expeditiously. Indian hospitals say their patients are dying because of a shortage of oxygen as COVID case numbers and deaths set new records for a third day running. India has recorded nearly a million infections in three days with 346,786 new cases in the past 24 hours. The country also reported 2,624 deaths taking the official toll to nearly 190,000 since the pandemic started. Officials say at the Jaipur Golden Hospital in Delhi, 20 people died overnight because of a lack of oxygen. We are facing a deep crisis. We have a large number of patients coming to the tertiary care hospitals. As we have seen that the smaller hospitals are getting closed because of the uh, supply chain issue of oxygen and more and more burden is coming on the larger hospitals. We have seen that every hospital is getting 200 to 300 COVID patients and all COVID patients are very sick, very critical. President Joe Biden has become the first U.S. leader to issue a statement formally describing the 1915 massacre of Armenians as a genocide. The killings took place in the winning days of the Ottoman Empire, the forerunner of modern-day Turkey. But the issue is highly sensitive, with Turkey acknowledging atrocities but rejecting the term genocide. A U.S. official said the move was not meant to place blame on modern-day Turkey. However, Turkey's foreign minister, Mevlut Cavusoglu, immediately tweeted that his government will not take lessons from anyone on our history. Previous U.S. administrations have not used the term in formal statements amid concerns over damaging relations with Turkey, a NATO ally. And Southeast Asian leaders have urged the head of the Myanmar army, which took part in a coup in February, to end the violent crackdown in that country. In his first known foreign trip since the takeover, General Min, Ao, General Min Aung Lang heard calls for the military to stop killing protesters and to release political prisoners. More than 700 people have been killed and thousands detained since the coup. Now, the gathering of leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, in Jakarta is the first coordinated international effort to ease the crisis in Myanmar. And the main news again. Seven members of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra were today killed in a raid on their hideout in Imo State by security operatives. And this came as gunmen killed three security personnel during an attack on Governor Hope Uzodima's country home. Also today, parents of the Greenfield University students still in captivity demanded the rescue of their children. President Mohamed Buhari also described the killing of the three of the abductees as barbaric terror attacks. And Indian hospitals today sent SOS as patients die because of oxygen shortage and as new record COVID case numbers and deaths are set for a consecutive third day. 
That's the news at 10. I'm Ayotunde Balogun. Many thanks for watching, and from all of us here, good night and stay safe.